On this episode of Discovering Wine Country, we are focusing on biodynamics and Troon Vineyard in Oregon's Applegate Valley. We will introduce you to biodynamics with several biodynamic vineyard owners we have spoken with. We will also touch on regenerative agriculture, which we will discuss more in a future episode. We speak with Andrew Beatty, their biodynamic consultant, and finally, taste through some of the Troon wines. As we mentioned before in our intro episode, we will be traveling down some rabbit holes. The conversations may meander down new paths and into subjects beyond what you might get in a typical piece. Just north of the California border, nested within the Rogue Valley, you find the Applegate Valley AVA. This valley, created by the Applegate River, has soils dominated by river sediment. The Pacific is just 50 miles away to the west, but the Siskiyou Mountains shield the region from the cool marine air. 50 miles long, covering 275,000 acres, the Applegate Valley ABA is home to 18 wineries, and it is spectacularly beautiful. So you're, you're in Applegate Valley now, here. Great trees and things like that. So we're like the transitional point between that California climate and the Willamette Valley climate. So it's a, I think that's an interesting place to make wine in transitional zones because you have really unusual weather patterns and things like that here. So it's a totally different ripening cycle. We'll go into that later. But we have 100 acres here, so 50 acres in vines. The rest are in apple trees and hay and livestock everything that we'll, we'll try to run and see that. So, but we're redeveloping everything because there was some, a lot of disease in the, in, the, in the vines. So we replanted everything. So I'm two thirds of the way in right now. This is two years old right now. Well, the one you came in there is, was just planted about a month ago. Wow. So we're doing about 10 acres a year. So it's a big project. In the early 1970s, Dick Troon was one of several modern day pioneers who planted vineyards in the valley. In 2017, Dr. Brian White and his wife Denise bought the property and began the conversion to biodynamic. As they replant, some of the varieties will be head trained. This gives the vines better protection from the sun and eases the vines' demand for water. They are also moving to no-till and are the second regenerative organic certified winery in the country. Craig Camp is the general manager for Trune Vineyard. He has spent over three decades working in all aspects of the industry. As you will see, he is passionate about biodynamics and regenerative agriculture in the vineyard. The property is thriving. They have beautiful gardens that grow the important plants for their biodynamic preparations. They have sheep that graze, and they're planting orchards for making cider and creating biodiversity. Craig tells us about the part of the Applegate Valley where Troon sits, explaining the geological history of this area in the Siskiyou Mountains. Okay, so we are at Troon Vineyard. This is the, we're standing on the Kubli Bench in the heart of the Applegate Valley here in Southern Oregon, and we are surrounded by the Siskiyou Mountains. The Siskiyou Mountains are, are not volcanic. They were pushed up against the coast. They were islands. So we have all these diverse soil types here that, that run through the property. There are various loams and gravels and river sediments, and it has this incredible diversity of soils that really adds a lot of complexity to the wine. And we're trying to uh, enhance that by, by spreading the varieties all over the site instead of having them in one large block everywhere. So it makes it harder to pick, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it makes the wine more interesting. So uh, down here in the, in, the, in, the, in the valley is the Applegate River, which runs across here. And the Applegate used to be up here. That's why there's the bench here. And, and so, you know, 50,000 years ago, whatever it used to be here, whatever it was, and it left a cut. And if you come here in the winter, uh, and there's no fog here in the summer at this altitude. We're about 1,400 feet right now. And there's no fog here in the summer, but in the winter, there's a lot of fog in the area. And But you'll come here on the Kubli bench, and you'll have like this donut of blue sky because of the way the, the, the um, air patterns come down from the canyons and create an uplift here. We had an airline pilot come in once he told us that he moved here because when he would fly in in the winter, there would be one place that was was open in the fog, and so he bought a house out here. So, um, uh, in this direction is the Pacific Ocean, which is just 60 miles away, 
So uh, you can feel a little breeze now, but in the afternoon, it'll be a lot of breeze. So even in, in, in a hot summer like this, it can be 100 in the afternoon, but be 50 degrees by 9 or 10 o'clock. So you get this huge diurnal shift. And that cut, so the Applegate River goes down there and meets the road, and it cuts through the mountains out to the ocean and creates a channel for that cold air from the Pacific to come in. So uh, the hotter it gets here, the more the air rises, the more it pulls air in. So we're able to get an incredible diurnal shift, which makes for wines with high acidity. And the, and the whole growing season here uh, emphasizes that because yeah, at this altitude and this far north, our growing season is much shorter than say Napa Valley. But uh, because of the, the, it's the longest day of the year, I'll get about 70 minutes more sunshine in the day than Napa does and no fog at all. So we get this complete, you know, we're able to catch up because of the hours of photosynthesis. But then at harvest in October, it reverses. The days get extremely short and um, photosynthesis will almost come to a halt. So I can let the fruit hang and develop flavor without losing acidity or uh, uh, having the sugars go up. So we can naturally get wines with moderate alcohol and high acid. That's the Applegate style and unique to what we do. So just to just run here, so that's Grayback over there at 7,000 feet. So there's the whole range of mountains. And even though we're 60 miles from the coast, it takes about two and a half hours to get there. <laughs> so that's, there's not, there's not a, a straight road and things like that. And this is incredibly, uh, it's wilderness area. It's totally undeveloped through there. So it's, it's just a unique place to grow, to grow grapes, and that's why I wanted to, to come here. And it's uh, been uh, really rewarding because I think we, as you will notice when we taste the wine, it's a very distinct style. As we mentioned before in our intro episode, we will be traveling down some rabbit holes. The conversations may meander down new paths and into subjects beyond what you might get in a typical piece. Now that we've learned a bit about Oregon's Applegate Valley, let's dive into biodynamics. Dynamics was a reaction to the industrial farming that came out of the Industrial Revolution, a time when mechanization and mass production were changing the natural way that farmers grew food. Farms got bigger, biodiversity dropped off, and with it, these large fields of one crop were more susceptible to pests and diseases. This created the need for pesticides. Farmers planted the same crop over and over, depleting the nutrients in the soil, and creating the need for added fertilizer. Biodynamics looks at each farm as an ecosystem, not a series of crops or livestock. In this way, the biodiversity of plants and animals work together to keep the farm healthy. It is based on the movement of the sun, moon, planets, and the seasons. There are nine specific preparations used to replenish the earth and the ecosystem, keeping the plants healthy, as well as the community of healthy microbes in the soil. Farming has always been based on seasons, and teas and early medicines were all made from plants. All of the chemicals we use come from resources we have on the planet. We've just removed them from nature by multiple degrees. The preparations begin with Biodynamic 500. Biodynamic Preparation 500 is cow manure, packed into a cow horn and buried in the earth in the winter months. Over the winter, this becomes a rich soil full of healthy microbes. A tea is made of this and is sprayed on the plants when planting or transplanting and is used to help the growth of the roots and build soil structure. Biodynamic Preparation 501 is silica, finely ground quartz, placed in a cow horn, buried in the spring, and dug up in the fall. It is sprayed on the plants in the spring and the fall to increase vigor while reducing their susceptibility to disease. The rest of the preparations are applied to the compost pile. Teas are then made from the compost to apply it in the vineyard or farm. 502 uses the blossoms of the yarrow plant. This is said to assist the plants in absorbing nutrients. 
503 is made with chamomile blossoms and is used to stabilize the nitrogen in the compost and stimulate plant growth and soil life. Stinging nettle is used for 504, which is buried through a full winter and summer surrounded by peat moss. This is said to enliven the soil. For 505, ground oak bark is buried in a rain barrel. This preparation is meant to combat harmful plant diseases. 506 is made from dandelions and is meant to stimulate the silica and potassium in the soil. The juice is extracted from valerian blossoms to make 507. It ferments for a few weeks. This is often used for frost protection and is said to stimulate the phosphorus in the soil. 508 is a preparation to help moderate growth and is a tea made of the horsetail herb. All of these are homeopathic preparations meant to stimulate and enhance the soil. They were based on things that were available on farms at the time and in the specific area. Vignerons who are growing biodynamically are always looking to new natural solutions that come from their properties. Climates and soils are different around the globe, as are pests, so adapting and learning is important. All of these preparations are environmentally friendly. Do they all work and do what they were intended to do? That is up for debate, but they certainly do not hurt, unlike the chemical pesticides that are on the market. They also do not all need to be used. Each place is different and the whole process is meant to increase soil health. Listening to the plants, they will tell you what they need. Science and soil samples also help agriculturalists telling them what the soil needs. Biodynamic growers pride themselves on vineyards where children and pets can safely run without worrying about chemicals. Former owner Bill Steele of Cowhorn Vineyards explains it best. I think the thing that's most important about it to me is 365 days a year I can have people on the property. My friends, kids, my nieces, my nephews, the dogs, people bring dogs every day. There is no hazmat suit here. Yeah. So it's, it's a safe environment. And that's one of the reasons why you see all these birds here. So prior to Barb and I finding the property, it had been left alone for 15 years. So we started with a blank canvas. We've been now operating it for 16 years. So it's, it's documented 30 years without synthetic chemicals. That's why we have boatloads of birds and boatloads of bees. And so I think what really floats my boat, well, there's several things about biodynamics, but one of them that's important is it's a safe, it's a safe place for people to visit. You also find that these places are teeming with life. The soil is full of microorganisms. You hear bird song. The people here are also attentive to the land and the life on it. Perhaps all that spirituality just comes down to a sense of harmony, working with the land, not just on it. Biodynamics in practice helps create an ecosystem where plants and animals thrive. This helps with pest control because you have happier plants therefore better tasting grapes, so it all does factor in. When we spoke with Rod Windrum, the past owner and founder of Crinklewood Vineyards in Australia, he summed it up pretty well. We will let him have the final word. The flow forms and tanks are for making the biodynamic teas, which are used in the vineyard. They also have a patch where they bury their cow horns for two of the biodynamic preparations that they use. Biodynamics is really all about having a self-sustaining farm. The preparations are used in lieu of pesticides and fertilizers. These are made from plants grown in the vineyard and from manure from the cows on the property. They use these natural preparations rather than something brought in that was chemically made in a factory somewhere. Rod is well read on the subject of biodynamics and rattled off a series of books and authors that he had taken inspiration from. These range from microbiologists to biodynamic agriculture specialists to a scientist whose focus is on plant frequencies. Getting an understanding of um, the, the biology that you've got, benef you know, like beneficial um, critters in your, in, your, in your compost or your compost tea, um, and even doing things like measuring the um, um, biological coverage on a, on a leaf. You know, you, we send it away to a lab, and if you've got you got, say, if you get up to about 80% biological coverage on your leaf, uh, um, the nasties won't attack it, you know? Rod tells me that they check the bricks levels in the stems. 
If the level gets to 16 to 18 bricks, pests won't attack it. Pests are predators and they look for weak plants to attack. This is where he refers to the work of Philip Callahan, who studied the frequencies that plants give off. The frequency, when a plant is not healthy, can be picked up by pests who will then attack. We get into a conversation about the difficulties using biodynamic methods when you have summer rain. At this point, Rod has a story for me. All right, now my little story. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's sort of, uh, we'd been going in, we started, we started first using biodynamic uh, here, biodynamic preparations in 2002. And, and, um, and we got to 2008 and, and uh, the local college and other, other contractors would say, you know, like that's just the drought, you know, like that. And it's sort of a uh, 2008 came and it pissed down raining the whole vintage. And we, we, we were going, oh God, this, look, there's downy sort of starting to break out. And we, what were we doing? We, um, Lawson that worked for me at the time was really an awesome guy. And, and um, we'd found through um, going to different agricultural days, um, we, we met up with some guys in the cotton industry that were really keen on, on heading down the organic fashion, which is very anti-organic -chem camp cotton. And this guy was breeding um, species or geni of, of fungi that he said that would predate predated on downy spores. So we got this, we got some of that from him, and we made a compost tea with that. Yeah. And we bred them up, the numbers up, and we sprayed this out, and we actually we managed survive the whole year with downy and picked every grape on the property. And what it did was it sort of this this compost tea we sprayed out was. Would, was would the, the downy spores were like white underneath the leaf. Mm -hmm. They just sort of turned them like a red rusty color, and we managed it. And and, and so we we thought, yay! And it was a biodynamic head that sort of um, just we didn't want to give up. We'd been going for so many years, and there's so many people that have actually started doing it. And the first the first rainy couple of days, and they're back into the chemical shed, you know. We're convinced now we can actually wave the flag. We're biodynamic, you know, because we can actually survive. Yeah. So, so it's just a matter of actually having the will and the passion to sort of yeah. fight your way through it. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can't do it. You can't employ. You can't employ the passion, and you can't employ the the, the energy to actually to see it through. While visiting Troon, Craig took us through the biodynamic shed. The shed houses the worm bin for vermiculture their cow horns and herbs. It is here that they brew the teas for the preparations in large compost tea brewers. This is also the hub for their irrigation system that pulls in water from multiple wells on the property. The irrigation system is the delivery system for the compost tea. This is finished 500. Okay. So you, you literally, you put raw manure in a horn and six months later you get this. Okay. And then this again is mixed with the tea and that's sprayed on the vineyard. So most of these are, what you're doing are fermentations. You're doing various fermentations and then taking that biology from that fermentation and inoculating it into the soil. And this is, uh, this is barrel compost. The same thing you go through, you add minerals and eggshells to that. And make that barrel compost. Yes. A lot of the fermentations that they made up were originally done in animal organs. Right. So there's been experiments. So we're replacing stag bladder with birch. So that's hollowed out birch with the yarrow inside. So that'll ferment over the summer, and then and then it's we you know we extract the teas yes. instead of, instead of using animal parts. That's fantastic. Then we visited the garden where they grow the plants for their biodynamic preparations. These preparations are applied to the compost piles and get the bacteria going that will make a pile of, well, poop into a rich, healthy compost filled with microbial life. So um, this is part of our bee rewilding project. Uh huh. So the idea is we don't harvest the honey or anything. And this one's not populated, it was a bad 
so with the heat and the dryness, it's not been a yeah. good year for bees. But we expect it will be. There's three of them on the property, uh -huh. and we don't harvest the honey. They get to keep the honey. But the idea is is that they, they believe that when you rewild the bees, they that rebuilds their immune systems. And so you're you're adding, then they go out and mate and everything, and spread that stronger immune system through the uh, population of the general area. That's fantastic. So again, it's not, not just bees, not just for your vineyard and your property here, bees for the world. Yeah, they do chip in on the apple trees though. Well, so. there you go, that's true, that's true. <laughs> So this, uh, you know, this obviously just this is more pollinator. Yeah. Um, things like that. It's beautiful too. I mean, so just... uh, this is where we grow all the plants for the biodynamic crops. So we've already harvested this is yarrow. We've already we've already picked that, and uh, so all of them are here. So we grow our own, make our own. You know, it's all on site, and done. This is actually the barrel compost. So, ah, gotcha. And then we make it in bricks. So you put all the ingredients in here. Right. And then it, after about four months, it's finished. So this eventually will look like what what I just showed you in there, which looks like potting soil. Gotcha. So, yeah. So the thing about the biodynamic preps is that only 500 and 501 are actively sprayed around the plants. Everything else goes into the compost. So gotcha. Compost is the foundation of everything. Right. And, and the difference between biodynamic compost and organic compost is organic compost, you have to get to a much higher temperature because they want to kill the microbiology. Okay? So uh, but with biodynamic compost, we ferment it at a much lower temperature by turning it more and, and um, uh, keeping it damper. And uh, um, so... Our goal is to build up the microbiology and then apply that to the soil. I mean, there's certainly a nutritional value to the compost and the soil, mm -hmm. but that's not the real goal. The real real goal is the microbiology because a vine just doesn't need a lot of, it's not like soybeans or corn that needs, you know, huge amounts of NPK. This is a, uh, it needs, very, vines mm -hmm. need very little. In fact, too much nitrogen is, is, is not good for the vine. Right. So. Andrew Beattie is the biodynamic consultant for Troon Vineyard. Andrew has spent his life surrounded by biodynamics. He worked alongside the late Alan York, a prominent biodynamic consultant. He now consults with a variety of organic and biodynamic farms and vineyards. Well, the, the start of the season is uh, 500 in barrel compost. Okay. So right when we start cultivating in the vineyards, so in the spring, like when we mow for frost, right after we mow, we'll apply that 500 in barrel compost. And then during the growing season, we turn to the 501. And it's obviously applied to the canopies. And then in the fall again, when we start preparing like the seabed for our cover crops, then we'll repeat the application of 500. Gotcha. Barrel compost. So twice with the 500 and once with the, the 501 in the middle of the season, or just yeah, as basically a base, seasonally? Yeah. Right. But again, like, um, you have to start with the base. Right. But then if we see blocks that perhaps need, like, when we repond a new block, then we can double up and add more 500 barrel compost out there because we want to, you know, we're focusing on the root system, so right. I don't really care about the canopy yet. Right. So then, you know, maybe if we see a block that has, like, a, maybe a heavier mildew or something like that, then we can start adding, like, the 508 equisetum, you know, turn to, like, different tools that we have. So, it, again, start with the base and then refine that block by block. So. Excellent. And there's like different ways of getting the preps out. Like we were just talking today here in the, in the worm bin. We were talking today about beginning to add once a month adding preps actually into this as well. Oh, yeah. Into the worm bin. And then once we make the vermal compost and run that through our tea machine, then we're again getting that um, additional effect of the preps as well. So it's not just like Again, start with the base. Once you've laid that foundation, now we really start refining it. Right. Block block. Excellent. Like, yeah, it's just, we had a few escapees this morning. Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh. They made a run for it. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't get far, so that's good. <laughs> get back in there. Yeah, get back yeah. in there and do your work. Oh, we yeah. see them there now. Hey, guys. So we'll start cutting this in probably another month, six weeks. They take a while to get going, these worm bins. 
But once you get them going, they look after themselves. Um, we also add 500 and barrel compost every time we make compost tea. Gotcha. So like if like the books, the, the, the instruction books, you know, they, you never fertigate 500 or barrel compost. Right. But like why, we're not going to restrict ourselves to just doing it right. you know, by the doctrine. You know, because the whole thing about five minutes is just you know, develop it that works for your farm. You, know? you have to, yes. Developing for the farm, particular yep. farm and, yeah, exactly. and moving and things along. Yes, and yeah. climate. Yeah. Can't do much about the fires, but... <laughs> no, no. Not at this point yeah. yet. Yes, you the Valerian. Oh, yes, yeah. we're talking about the Valerian out uh -huh. there, and I had asked because I had seen one of the, uh, one of the chateaus in uh, Chablis had mentioned using Valerian during the frost as frost protection. Sure. Um, and I was just was curious about the reasoning behind that and how that, how that worked. And, Right, was, so usually valerian is applied to the compost, uh -huh. and that's the only compost herb preparation that's actually applied on a mist, like around the pile, instead of put inside the pile. So that application just brings like a warm element onto your compost pile, makes it more receptive to warmth and sunlight. And gotcha. So the idea of using that as frost is to try and put that warm envelope around, around the vines. Okay. But they don't. I mean, we trialed that a little bit this year, I think. Um, and we actually made so much valerian that we're going to really turn to that in the spring. But it's not as effective as the As fans. the fans. <laughs> Got it. Just, okay. But, you know, you just go, again, you lay that base once you've done that. And right. You can really start focusing on that. But if you focus on that first. Right. It's, it's all about it's be a yeah. You just have to fine tune once you yeah. Well, set yourself up something. for success. Exactly. Otherwise, it's just why you're doing it. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs>
It's just uh, healthy fruit and, and, and squeaky clean hygiene. This is the wine that you can literally serve with anything. I've had it from sushi to uh, dessert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Steak. Mm, yeah. Because it's got enough um, tannic structure in yeah, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's which it's not too much, but mm -hmm. it was they were okay on their own. But when they were introduced to being, it just it was like magic. You know, set it off. Something about the the Viognier, and even when it's a cooler climate, and it does, you know, it's there's a, a bit of viscosity and body to mm -hmm. it always. Mm -hmm. So, um, I had a thought there. Oh, you mentioned Grenache Gris because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of Grenache Gris there being grown. Not. I mean, yeah. it's not it's not a. Yeah. We may be the only ones in Oregon with that one. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Where so, did yeah. that come from for you? Uh, this this is from a uh, wonderful nursery. That's actually their name. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. But, well, they have Grenache Gris, so... They're wonderful. <laughs> this, I think, really highlights the more northern Rhone kind of style we get here, where you get that black pepper and earthiness and everything, instead of the kind of the, the California version, which tends to be riper, rounder, yeah. fruitier. Washington. But instead of that kind of just simple red fruit, you get that kind of black pepper and yeah. spice. And, we can smell on the nose. It's got so much black pepper on the yeah. nose. Trin has changed their labels to have artwork of the plants they used in their biodynamic preparations on the label. There is Yarrow on the Vermentino and the Cote de Kubli White, Dandelion on the Kubli Banchamber, and Valerian on the Cote de Kubli Red. Beyond these wines, they are making Piquette, a pet gnat of Tanat, a Vermentino in Amphora, Nouveau-style carbonic maceration Grenache, and other really interesting and delicious wines. The wines here have a vibrance, part of which is the nature of growing in the Applegate Valley, and part from the biodynamic methods they use to grow these grapes. The wines are alive and delicious. Trun is biodynamic and regenerative certified. Another great sustainable feature is their charging station for electric and hybrid vehicles. The morning had been clear, but as we left, some of the smoke was being pulled in from the fires that had started up the night before due to lightning strikes. The vines were fine, the fires far enough away that the smoke would not cause damage, but it's a reminder of how fragile our planet and ecosystem are. We headed down, off the Kubli bench, and on to our next adventure. Are you ready to continue discovering wine country? Follow us on social media for all the juicy bits. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at discoverwinecgc. If you're headed to wine country and want to share the experience, join our Facebook group, Discovering Wine Country, where writers and content creators are sharing what they are discovering in wine country around the globe. For even more great content, visit our sister site, Crushed Grape Chronicles, 